Hello. <clears throat> so Terraformer. Um, first thing I want to make sure that you see is that uh, it's up on GitHub. So if you're wanting to play along, uh, just go ahead and get up on GitHub, clone the repo down, take a look, because this is exactly what we're going to be talking about. If I can get my... So what is a Geo Toolkit? Well, Geo Toolkit is an easy way to work with Geo data. And this being an open source project, we started from scratch and went with as many open source projects and parts and pieces as possible. So by default and natively, it's dealing with GeoJSON, which is an open standard for dealing with Geo data. And it's, it's a great way to represent data. So it's a JSON object. As you see, this one is a polygon, has some coordinates. And if I just go click on this Add to Map button, you'll see what it actually looks like, this little triangle here. So this, this is a live map. We've just added this uh, GeoJSON here. We're actually using Leaflet here to do all of the additions. But GeoJSON's nice and everything. But what about other formats, like well-known text? And well-known text came out of the Open Geospatial Consortium. This is a, a fairly big standard here as far as dealing with data. As you see, it's a little bit different. Instead of being a JSON type, it's a text. It's a polygon with these coordinates here. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. And what if we want to deal with this stuff? Well, Terraformer does it for you. There's just this well-known text parse method, which it's doing the background here when I add it. It actually parsed this example and dropped it on the map. Well, there are other formats as well. Esri, where I work, has their own format, this ArcGIS JSON, which is once again fairly similar. It, it, is, it is JSON and it has these rings. It doesn't necessarily tell you what the data is, so you kind of have to do some inference based on the data. But it includes cool things like spatial references. And, well, what if you want to deal with those? Well, thankfully, this is pretty much the same polygon. And we're adding to the map. So right out of the gate, we gain GeoJSON support, ArcGIS JSON support, and well-known text support. So this gives us a great way to work with multiple different types of data. And you know, it's, it's just a really cool way to exist with a whole bunch of different ecosystems. But Terraformer does geographic stuff too. And what do I mean by geographic stuff? I mean primitives. So because everything in Terraformer is GeoJSON, we can throw GeoJSON at it and it'll figure it out. So this is actually instantiating a polygon. And there are more types than just a polygon. GeoJSON supports multi-polygons, which are multiple polygons. Uh, polygons have the possibility of having holes in them, like a donut. Uh, there are points. There are lines. Uh, there are multi-lines. There, there's a whole bunch of stuff. But what it doesn't support is circles. So we went ahead and implemented circles. I mean, what's a circle? It's just a bunch of points, right? I mean little arcs, you end up, uh, when you're dealing with graphics and uh, things like that, just trying to approximate a circle. In this case, this is a very, very, very gross circle. So I instantiated a circle with uh, our office, because you know that's, that's where I work, so it's nice downtown here, uh, 100 meter radius, and uh, uh, gave it uh, 10 points. And the only reason why I gave it 10 points was, I don't know if you noticed, but this is a really small box. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that you guys could actually see what, what happened here. So keeping track of all of this, we still have uh, the fact that it's a polygon. We have all these segments, just 10 of them. And then we have these properties, which are, once again, part of the GeoJSON spec that allows us to show our radius, our center, and the number of steps so that we can go ahead and rebuild that whenever we feel like it. It's, it's, a, it's a big plus for us just because it allows us to represent something that most of us use every day that aren't necessarily part of 
the standards, just because in, in the GIS world, circles are evil. They don't really project well. They're, they're, you know, they're just not, they're not cool. So what else do we have? We have lost our scope. All right. We have intersections. So being able to look at a polygon and try to determine whether or not it intersects, that's a lot of math. And math isn't necessarily fun to do in your code. So Terraformer helps you deal with all of that. It gives you the ability to determine whether two polygons intersect. Likewise, gives you the ability to see if a polygon contains, which apparently I didn't finish that slide. <laughs> so, where did my, uh, the other cool things, uh, how many people here have uh, heard of the Waldo Canyon fire? Small number of you. The Waldo Canyon fire is actually rather special, uh, at least as, as far as we're concerned. I mean, this has about 6,500 points to it. Uh, it's a beastly little polygon here, and I can, I can zoom in on it and, and show you everything. But this is, this is a fire that burned in, I believe, the summer of 2012. Um, did a, quite a lot of damage. And some of these places that are the holes here are actually lakes and other water features. So that's how they survived. Now, I mentioned this is a little bit special. Part of the reason for this is that this is the polygon that we used to continually crash PostGIS. It is such a complicated, such a funky polygon that it would, uh, PostGIS 1.9, which thankfully they fixed it in 2.x, it would just take the server down. Uh, your, your whole database is just seg fault. That's a pretty funky, funky, uh, uh, polygon. So we use this as sort of a test case for is our code working? Are inserts fast? Are we able to do things? And I'm using this for a test case for one of our geometric uh, things, a convex hull. How many people know what a convex hull is? Right, we have a few people. That's awesome. So uh, I'm going to show you. <laughs> and this is something Terraformer just does for us. It just goes ahead and Shows us, you know, the pretty much the whole outline of the polygon itself. <clears throat> That's pardon? Uh, yes, that was live in the browser. Terraformer is doing all this for us. It isn't doing projections um, onto the onto the map. That's uh, leaflet, but Terraformer is doing all of our math for us. So that momentary lag that it took was doing this on my poor little MacBook Air here, which isn't the latest and greatest. I'll tell you that. So, you know, all that's, all that's fun and good, but let me tell you about the most awesome piece of Terraformer. And this is, this is fairly new. So if you've heard me talk about Terraformer, or you've gone and checked it out, or anything else, it's, you know, Terraformer was great. But what makes it awesome, and what makes it something worth coming here and talking to all of you about, is the concept of a geostore. So what's a geostore? Well, as, as it says right there, it's a geodatabase building blocks. But what does that really mean? Well, you have the ability to have a concept of stores. So the base building block behind a store in the geostore is a bunch of interfaces. This is how you store the data. It doesn't matter where the data lives. It doesn't matter if the data lives over in a Postgres database, uh, a CouchDB database, the new Mongo uh, geo database. It, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if it lives in local storage, in the browser, or in memory, in a node process. Who, who really cares? I mean, it's, it's data. It's a way to access data, and it's a way to abstract that data. Other thing that's part of Geostore is indexes. And indexes are cool. It's a great way to be able to have a large amount of data, and very quickly try to determine, is this data I care about? Is this data I care about? And I'm sure that many of you have dealt with databases. How many, how many of you deal with databases on a regular basis? And how many of you create indexes on that database? How many of you have seen your queries sped up significantly by creating the right index? That's what we're doing. And you know, beyond specifying interface, Terraformer comes with an R-tree interface, or an R-tree index. So what does this really mean? 
Well, it means you can do some really cool things. So in my case, I think that R-tree indexes are super awesome, but they're not the uh, be-all, end-all of indexes. So what if we were to try to build some other type of index? This is about as cheap as you can go. This is as pathetic of an index as I could think of making, and I really stretched my brain on this one. This is an array. So what we're doing on this index is we're taking each polygon, because we know what a polygon is. We are looking for its bounding box, its, its rectangle that defines it. So everything that that polygon contains, and we're calculating it here, so rect from shape. Um, we're adding, because we have an interface to meet, we're adding serialize, we're adding deserialize, which in this case is mostly a bunch of deferred callbacks. I mean, all we're doing for our, uh, for our serialize is just returning our array. Deserialize, we're just setting our array to what's coming in. It, it's, uh, it's just an array, it doesn't really matter. And then when we're searching this array, we're iterating through it and saying, is this point, that I am looking at, is it inside this box? Is this polygon that we're looking at, is it inside this box? It's, it's as dumb and as straightforward as you can get. Is this fast? Anybody? Aw, oh, come on. I get one nod from somebody who should know better, and then, no, it's not fast. You're iterating through an array every single time of possibly 20, 30,000 objects just to figure out if something's in a point or if something is, uh, is, 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 is that we even care about looking at. So how many people here know what an R tree index is? One, two, three. Uh, I, I looked around when I got in here to see if there were any. Uh, markers or anything, but I, I didn't see any markers. Otherwise, I'd try to draw you an archery index. But I'll try to describe it visually so that you can sort of understand what an archery index is. An archery index is a way of storing data in a, oh, Manny, you rock. <laughs> a way of storing data in a bunch of different boxes where you can make a decision and through the process of elimination, try to determine which way you want to go. So the topmost here contains all of the shapes that you care about. It knows about everything, and it knows that all of these shapes are contained inside of here. So we need to make a decision. Do we go left? Do we go right? Because those shapes are somewhere. So let's say this one contains the circle, the square, and the square. And this one contains, sort of stretched out, but you get the point here, the square and the square. So we have essentially divided this here. Now we have three places we can go down here. We have two places we can go down here. This one contains the square. This one contains a circle. We've terminated our index. This one over here contains the circle here, the square, and the square, which means we have one more layer here. There's a square on the left and the square on the right. So we've gone ahead and generated an R-tree index. This is a fairly efficient data structure. This is pretty good, pretty efficient, especially when you're searching through 30, 40,000 different uh, polygons in order to figure out, is this something I care about? Sorry for the dumb question. Rectangles. No, no other difference. Just rectangles. Exactly. So um, it's, it's just you take, you take these rectangle approximations uh, hence the rectangles here, and you drop them in, 
and those become the shapes that you are then searching against. But you're right, it's, it's a bee tree. So our trees are really cool, but what if we know a little bit more about the data that we're actually modeling? What if we kind of care about the stuff that we're doing, that we know what the shapes look like, we sort of understand what's going on? Well, I like to use as my data set all of the counties in the US. These are rough models, but you know, it's still quite a few counties. Uh, looks like just over 3,100. Pretty darn good for, uh, for a data set. Um, and I happen to know that the United States, including the whole Alaska thing over here to the left, is pretty well contained. I know that it's about uh, longitude 110 across, um, that it starts at about negative uh, 170 longitude, and that it goes all the way to about negative 66. I know this because I actually analyzed it. So because I know what's going in there, I can be a little bit more creative. I can create what I call a super array index which is very specialized for dealing with a different type of data. So I can create a number of buckets, my furthest left x, and the width. I know that my furthest left x is negative 171, or maybe it's 177, uh, we can find that. Uh, I know the width is about 110 longitude, and I know that uh, if I start throwing data in here that I can have it start sorting it into little buckets for me. So that's what I did here. Um, serialize, uh, it's about the same. I'm just taking this index. Deserialize, it's uh, about the same. And we add a bucket from rectangle that goes ahead and does a little bit of math, figures out what bucket we uh, want to drop stuff into. And then we do a search, which figures out the bucket, and then simply does an iteration through the array. So what have I done here? I've taken off. I've split the work into 40 possible bits of work. Of course, the United States being what it is, um, Aleutian Islands, Alaska having very few counties, pretty much nothing for a little while, and a huge amount of counties toward the uh, East Coast, it's, it's not exactly congruent, which means that we can improve on this. But now that we know that we have a good base starting point, Let's go ahead and start benchmarking this and figuring out what's going on. So for my benchmarks, I'm using Benchmark.js here. And I decided that I wanted to go ahead and load up the counties. I wanted to load up an array index, uh, an R-tree index that comes with Terraformer, a super array. I wanted to create geostores with a store and an index which um, here I went ahead and did here. So 40 buckets, negative 171, 107. So I was, I was pretty close. And we're going to iterate through the counties. We're going to add them all to the Geostore. And then we're going to take a couple of points. I want it to be as realistic as possible without completely overwhelming the benchmark and having a snooze here for a while. So I chose Portland, LA, so we have West Coast, North and South, Bismarck and Austin, so more central, and then Boston and Tampa. It's not, I, I could probably have chosen something worst case scenario, but I figured this is a pretty good worst case scenario. So I have some test suites. I'm iterating through an array index test, a superstore index test, and an R tree test, and then I'm just telling, finding out what's, what's best. Anybody have any bets? Well, let's find out. Now remember, I took a look at the data. I should know this. So we're going to let this run. Twenty-two hundred and sixty-seven operations per second on array index. Forty-eight hundred and thirty-four on superstore index. 
and 4,080 on our tree. Why is this? It's 3,000, it's a small set, and because I knew the exact width of the data and pretty much how many I'd be going in each bucket, which by the way, I think the largest bucket is about 630 uh, that it can index through, this still isn't the best case scenario, but for data sets that I customize, let's say all the TriMet stops here in uh, the Portland metropolitan area, this is exactly what we want to do. So it isn't just our trees or these super array index or whatever else that we want to throw at it. It's also we can throw a, a, a Q tree at it, a KD tree, whatever other data modeling that we want to throw at it to index this data, we can just use that. Whatever makes more sense for us and the data that we're dealing with, there's one interface to deal with it. We just instantiate the index. No big deal. Same with the data store. If it's Postgres, great. If it's an in-memory store, great. It doesn't really matter. The interface is still the same. We're just instantiating the data. We're throwing it in there. We're interfacing it the exact same way. And we just get it by sheer winning. So where, where does that take us? Well, it works in the browser. So this is, this is pretty big. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I've been paying attention to the fact that this presentation is all running in a browser. Uh, it can load via the script tag. It can load via AMD. It works in Node.js. Very straightforward. We just require Terraformer. We can instantiate a new polygon. So that gives us a lot more power. Or we can have things like this. I mean, this is something that I've seen done from Microsoft in Silverlight. But why would I want to instantiate Silverlight to be able to see well-known text or GeoJSON or ArcGIS JSON? I mean, it's just, it just doesn't make sense to me. So I have over here. I want to show you just how basic those counties were because I, I have uh, about 1.7 gigs of all the county data that's about as fine as that Waldo Canyon fire, but it was just a little bit too much for this little uh, machine to load up in a web browser. So I, I decided that I would use these smaller representations, which as you see in just a moment, are a little bit more basic. So how many people know what Multnomah County really looks like? It's, it's not quite this. I, I think that uh, it doesn't include Washington. I think that it has a few more curves here. And I, I think that the river is more of a guideline. But it's a fairly good representation at very low resolution. So we can do the same thing. We can show bounding box. We can show the convex hull. Um, and we can do this in all sorts of different, uh, all sorts of different uh, well-known text, GeoJSON, ArcGIS. Now remember, all of this is just straight up native JavaScript. We're not, we're not hitting a web service for this. We're not uh, loading this all uh, via a C plugin or anything else. This is, this is just running in the browser. So what if we were to do the same sorts of cool things from Node? Well, I already showed you the uh, indexes. But what if we have this uh, well-known text here? And this well-known text is well-known text representation of the Waldo Canyon Fire, once again, my kind of go-to. This thing is pretty big. I mean, what is that, 117K? All right, so we have this little script here that loads up the Terraformer well-known text parser and the Terraformer ArcGIS parser. And as I said before, um, it by itself, uh, it the whole package uses GeoJSON. So there's 
well-known text, ArcGIS, GeoJSON. So what if we run this thing, convert? It's telling us that we have an in format. Uh, we know it's one on text. Out format. Uh, let's do GeoJSON. And foo.wkt. And it goes ahead and does the conversion to us to uh, GeoJSON. Let me uh, pipe that into less so we can get a little bit better view of it. There it is, it's a multi-polygon. There are all the coordinates, and it just keeps going. And that, that, was, that was pretty fast for going from something we were parsing down to, uh, down to this uh, other format. And let's, just to figure out how fast, I'm going to throw a, a time statement on here. Um, uh, real, about 20 milliseconds. So, I mean, I can, I think I can deal with that. And that, if you'll remember, that's firing up Node.js and loading everything off disk as well. Um, beyond that, there are a bunch of other really cool things that you can do. So, we had this time zone server. This was a, a post-GIS instance that was set up with a web server in front of it that was pretty much utilizing a whole machine so that we could pass in a latitude and a longitude and figure out exactly what time zone that that was supposed to be in. That's a lot of work to do something that you would think was very, very simple. But it's not exactly simple. It's, we look at the United States where we have these just a couple of time zones and you know those weird funky places like Arizona that, that want to have everything broken up or just don't want to deal with time zones. But it's really not all that easy. So if we take a look at time zones here, that's, what, 93 megs of just time zones. And if we take a look at it, it's a feature collection filled with teach features that give us the geometric outline of each of these time zones. So what if we were to write a little node service to do this? So Aaron Parecki, uh, also from Esri, uh, decided that one day he just was going to do this. We had a server that we really wanted to take out of production. It was, as I said, a Postgres instance, PostGIS instance, and a web server, not even idling away. It was, it was taking up some decent processor time just to get a time zone. So he used Terraformer and wrote this. And this is in the examples in Terraformer. So this, this comes just by cloning. So if we run the node index.js, it's going to tell us here when it's done loading. It's listening. It took five seconds to load all of that in. And we're in America, Los Angeles. So we do a time on that. <coughs> so. Let's get a time on that here. And that's two milliseconds to determine what time zone that we're in, which is a fantastic use of technology. And we can do this in the browser. We can load all this data in. It's, it's, it's really easy. We can start keeping track of all these parts and pieces either away in a database, away in a RESTful service, or in the browser. We can separate the index up. And Terraformer allows us to do all of this. So it's open source from the ground up. Not only did we write it to be open source, it was written with open source standards, uh, written with GeoJSON, written with Node.js, written with open source, source tools, and pull requests are very, very much encouraged. Questions? You know, uh, there are a few. There's GeoCommons, which uh, is fairly decent. There's uh, 
uh, Max Ogden has a good civic apps that I've been getting bridge data off of just because I really want to have understanding of when the Hawthorne Bridge is up and down. That's our most active bridge. It's also our most traveled for like bicycles. And having the ability to know when you need to divert from there, especially using uh, uh, geofencing, is very, very important because you can just divert away. So I've been looking for that information. And I found that a lot of people are grabbing it and putting it up on GitHub. And I, as much as I hate to say it, GitHub's a fantastic place for that to go. So we've been storing a lot of our data on uh, GitHub as well. GitHub did start rendering GeoJSON files by default a few days ago. So if you just go to it on GitHub, it just renders on the map. Yes, it does. Can yes, dot GeoJSON. Uh, we're trying to get them to uh, include uh, Terraformers. So we can do well-known text on ArcJSON. We'll see. Well, that's that's a that's a longer one. I might have to talk to your question. There's something to called you. Cartographer no. JS, and it, it has a US ID. It's kind of as a data source. And my GitHub has the not the rough, but the full counties. If you just want counties, it's the the 1.6 gig version. So. Um, the version that I wasn't willing to load up into my tiny laptop. Yes? Is there any opportunity there to use the ASMJS to work? Absolutely. And uh, one of the places that I plan on targeting it is to replace the well-known text parser, which let me show you so you can understand why I want to uh, replace it. And I will be targeting ASMJS. So, under source, parsers, one text, partials. Does this look familiar to anybody? It's a parser. Yeah, it's LALR. Um, this actually runs through, it's the Bison format. It runs through a package called JSON, and it creates some of the ugliest code I've ever seen in my life. And I've been writing parsers since about 1988, and it produces really ugly C code. It produces really ugly JavaScript code. So this is absolutely a target for implementation in ASMJS. This is a fairly decent parser uh, when it comes down to it, but um, let me show you what it actually turns into. Uh, we can do a good job of testing the functionality of this, but um, it's still not as nice as what, uh, what I'd want to see it be. And if we can target ASMJS, then we can have a lot more speed and functionality out of it. Also, streaming, which would be a big win, which we cannot do with this parser. Anyone else? Uh, everything. Uh, there's no XML HTTP uh, request, so it's anything IE7. Uh, I haven't tried it on 6 because I just haven't seen 6 anywhere, but uh, anything that can load JavaScript, it'll work since we have the ability to include it with the script tag. It just attaches itself to window. Uh, if you use uh, an AMD loader like RequireJS or Dojo, it, it will come in as, uh, as a module, uh, but we, uh, we tried to make it as flexible as possible. All right, well, I guess a couple of minutes early, and uh, thanks a lot, guys.